Welcome everyone to our welcome back. Um, for those of you who joined us last week for the Sustainable Wash Systems Closeout Event and Learning Series, we're excited to welcome you back for um, the second deep dive session on professionalized maintenance. Uh, so thank you so much everyone for joining us. Um, if this is your first time, uh, welcome to the Blue Jeans platform. Uh, we will be getting started here in just a few minutes. We want to allow people to kind of come into the room, get settled. We know um, it takes a few minutes for your audio and your video to come on and also get settled. So as we wait and, um, and welcome attendees, I'd love to invite you to come in and introduce yourself. So using the chat function, please provide your name, your organization, um, tell us where you're calling in from today. Uh, we this event has been um, been w wildly kind of a global event, so it's been exciting to see where people are coming in from. And then share with us what do you think are some of the most important components of a professionalized maintenance uh, system? So I have a very kind of clear example here on the on the screen. So welcome everyone. I hope you are having a wonderful start to your week, a wonderful start to your Monday. Um, but would love to hear from you already on uh, what do you think are some of the most important components of a professionalized maintenance system? Wonderful, thank you, Aline from Kenya, from World Water Supply Network. Thank you for being the first one to drop in uh, your information. RK, thank you, USAID, India. Oh, Suri, it's so great to see you. Thank you so much for coming. It's been a long time. Welcome everyone. So Ethiopia, great. Thank you, Eric, for sharing um, what you think is the most important component of professionalized maintenance system, which is participation of the user. Um, I think we'll be talking about that today. Welcome, Jan, for joining us. We are looking forward to this session. We have a very interactive, engaging session uh, for all of you. Um, today, we're going to uh, be breaking off into small groups, so learning and hearing more from you. Thank you, Ryan, for coming from Canada. So great to have you here. Maria, thank you for coming from UK, calling in from Wisconsin about an hour earlier than what I am here in Washington, DC. Mohammed, welcome from Ethiopia. Hey, Lucia, thank you for joining us. Great, thank you so much, Rachel. I see that um, you also feel that one of the most important components of professionalized maintenance system is customers' ability, ability and willingness to pay. Um, good finance systems and mechanisms. Thank you, everyone. I think that this is a great way to get started. Remote monitoring of water supply and quality. So thinking about um, the importance of that on the other end. Another another thought from Adrian on ver, ver, verifiable performance data. So data is very important uh, as an important component of professionalized maintenance systems. Supportive contracting environment, excellent. Some really great thoughts here today, everyone. So thank you so much. Well-trained and committed workforce. Um, thank you, Ron. Gathering input and buy-in at the design stage. Excellent, thank you. So we are very excited. We have a really packed agenda today. Um, and so I think it is gonna be important for us to start on time. Um, so thank you so much everyone for joining us. Please continue to engage via chat. We're gonna have other opportunities for you engage with your colleagues in the audience today. Um, we have an exciting um, small group breakout session that we have planned for today. Um, and with that, I think I'm gonna turn it over to Brittany to really get us started so that uh, we can um, be well on time. So thank you, Brittany. 
Thanks, Katie. Welcome, everyone, to day three of our SWS Closeout Event and Learning Series. My name is Brittany Anshrud. I'm the Chief of Party for the Sustainable Wash Systems Partnership, or SWS. Um, this is our second of three deep dive sessions on priority learning topics for SWS, and today we will focus on professionalized maintenance. If this is your second or third session, welcome back. Um, if you're joining for the first time, we are so happy to have you here. I'll take just a few minutes here to run through the Blue Jeans platform just to make sure that this feels comfortable for everyone and we can have your fullest possible participation for what I'm sure will be a very, very lively discussion today. So this event is being recorded and we will be sharing the link to the recording in a weekly recap email sent, we're sending this Friday. As a reminder, all participants are automatically muted and your cameras are switched off so you will not be visible in the recording. If at any point you're experiencing issues with the BlueJeans platform, please just let us know in the moderator chat and someone from our tech support team will be available to answer your questions and help with troubleshooting. If you want to make either the speaker video or presentation larger, you can adjust using the slider at the bottom of your screen. You can ask questions using the Q&A box. We'll be collecting these to ask our speakers after they finish their presentations. And we'll also have some dedicated SWS partners responding to your questions directly. We recommend using the Q&A box instead of the event chat. If you have a question you want one of our speakers or an SWS partner to respond to. And you can use the event chat to interact with each other and to post questions to the larger group. Uh, so um, a couple of recommendations for today. Um, we do recommend placing devices out of reach and closing other windows on your computer to avoid distractions. Please also note these shortcuts you can use in the chat box, a plus one to indicate agreement, the at sign to build off of a comment, the negative sign to indicate a different perspective, and feel free to use emojis as well. And so, as I mentioned at the start, uh, today is the second of three deep dives on SWS priority learning topics. We have a session on collective action this Wednesday, and our final session on Thursday uh, will be tying everything together and present key findings and recommend recommendations from each of these deep dive topics. Similar to last week, we'll be sending a tap into SWS learning email tomorrow and a weekly recap on Friday. <clears throat> For today's agenda, we'll be introducing the topic um, and explain what we mean by professionalized maintenance at the start. You'll then have the opportunity to hear from SWS experts in breakout rooms. So we've been inspired by the rich discussion that's transpired over the last two sessions and chose this format to really maximize space for key contributions and allow you to go a little bit deeper on one area of SWS research and learning. For the, for the second part of the session, we've assembled a great panel to discuss what donors and development partners should do differently to support this work. So you'll definitely want to stick around uh, for the full two hours. I'd now like to introduce our two leads for today's session. And as a, a reminder, you can access biographies for all of our speakers at a Google site we created for this event. And we'll go ahead and share that link in the chat. Ella Lazarte is a senior water and sanitation advisor in USAID Center for Water Security, Sanitation and Hygiene. She leads the agency's private sector engagement and finance work in the WASH sector and supports the design, implementation, and monitoring of WASH programs in USAID missions around the world. Harold Lockwood is the director of the UK consulting firm Agua Consult and an international expert in water supply and sanitation with 30 years of experience focusing primarily on the, sub, the rural subsector in areas, including institutional reform and sector policy development. So I will hand over to Ella now, and we will hear from Harold a little bit later. Over to you, Ella. Great, thanks so much, Brittany. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, everybody, for those of you uh, that are tuning in later um, their day. Really excited to be part of this session today. It's been, it's actually even more exciting because I get to see the fruits of our labor um, at USAID five years after, right? And this was actually just full disclosure. This was actually my first task. I wouldn't call it a task. It was more of a labor of love 
uh, when I first joined USA day one uh, in end of June, July 2016. Uh, and essentially, it's been a journey uh, with the Sustainable Wash Systems Learning Partnership. So I'm very excited uh, to be part of this panel today and, and, have, and share our lessons and findings with you and also hear from you and, and, and get your thoughts and perspectives. And so 2016 was when it all began, our SWS, I'll just call it SWS for now, uh, partnership. It was born out of a co-creation process. Uh, can you uh, move the slides, please? It was born out of a co-creation process where we selected four concepts, as you can see on the screen, around the globe to test different ideas, new ideas, approaches, and tools to overcome barriers for improving wash services, wash service sustainability. And you'll see those concepts on uh, the screen, uh, on the slide uh, in front of you on the map. And they're quite varied. As you will see all the way up top on the right, uh, we supported collective action for rural sanitation and hygiene services in Cambodia. And then uh, in Ethiopia, part of our work was on collective action for small town sanitation. And then the other part was on rural water. And in the last uh, two countries, and you'll see in the bottom, preventative maintenance approaches for rural water points in Uganda and similarly uh, in Kenya. And so you'll see that it's quite different. It's all across the globe. Uh, and uh, today we'll just focus on the Uganda, Kenya, and Ethiopia experience, focus on professionalized maintenance. And really the partnership was about learning. It's a it's uh, to help USAID and the sector to learn about a set of promising systems-based approaches to sustainability, understand when and where and how these can be applied, not just in our current, but future programs. Next slide, please. So why the focus on professional maintenance? Well, because it's an essential component of a system, and if a water point or a water system breaks down and does not get maintained, then you've got some sustainability challenges, which is essentially a systems failure. So we got to look at it from a systems perspective. And so what you'll see here on the graph, so on the left side, it shows the repair times uh, that are slower when you compare community managed systems and performance based managed uh, systems or performance based maintenance delivery. And then on the right hand side, if you'll see, I know it's, it's probably quite small, um, but the right shows that essentially the uptime, uh, the percent of days per year that a system is functional is higher in those systems where you have performance-based maintenance as opposed to uh, those that are community managed. And so that's just a little bit of, of the graphic. There will be more on this as we continue our discussions today. Um, and uh, next slide, please. So what exactly is professional maintenance, right? So you can look, for those of you, since we're all online, you can look at the publication that's on the screen. It's Professionals Maintenance for Rural Water Service Provision. And uh, it's a publication that looks towards a common language and vision for what we mean. But essentially, it's these five, uh, it's these five elements that are on uh, in front of you on the screen. And so first is clear legal and policy frameworks. Who owns the assets? Who's supposed to maintain them? Uh, can you delegate the maintenance functions? Uh, what, what about the entities? Uh, do we have legal entities to perform those functions? Uh, formalized contracts between the service provider that provides that maintenance and consumers is, uh, are also important. And that's important for accountability. Uh, as you can see in, in the last part of the slide, an accountability frameworks for consumers, uh, potentially having a third party oversight or independent regulator. Um, and then train personnel uh, so that they can actually work with monitored performance indicators. And then lastly, uh, financing arrangements. Uh, who pays for it? How much is it? Um, and who's responsible? So next slide, please. What does professionalized maintenance look like? Well, here's a little video uh, that we want to share with you from Kitui County, Kenya. My name is Cliff Nyaga, and I'm the director of Fundifix in Kenya. 
I'm responsible for strategy development and performance management. Fundifix is a Fundi Kenyan owned and registered company. My name is Cliff Nyaga and I'm the director of Fundifix in Kenya. I'm responsible for strategy development and performance management. Fundifix is a Fundi Kenyan owned and My name is Cliff Nyaga and I'm the director of Fundifix in Kenya. I'm responsible for strategy development and performance management. Fundifix is a Fundi Kenyan owned and registered company that specializes in the repair and maintenance of existing rural water points. These are hand pumps and small pipe systems that serve rural communities, health facilities and also local schools. We work in two counties in Kenya, that is Kitui County and Kuala County. And uh, we are also looking for opportunities to expand to other counties in Kenya and the countries in Africa. The reason for this being that the rationale of the Fundifix model is based on the insurance logic that can reduce its risk. As we, if we can bring in more and more counties and water systems serving rural communities, then we will be able to reduce the cost of maintenance service and improve viability of Fundifix. My name is Momi Kefoko. I'm a technical officer in the phone fix. My duties being um, overseeing the day-to-day -day operations of the phone fix, that is uh, repair and maintenance activities to see whether they are carried on within the, the given period that we agreed with our clients. You know, phone fix uh, is a service provider. So my duties uh, to make sure that the agreement that we have with the community is well handed to. For example, uh, we have agreement with the community that we love to, to repair the breakdowns of the hand pumps within a, a, a downtime of three days. So I have to make sure that every breakdown is repaired as per our agreement. That is three days for the hand pumps and five days for the pipe to scheme. So with, uh, uh, with the kind of service that we provide, especially the water services, repair and maintenance of the rural water systems, this is very important to our community because we make sure that the water keeps flowing all the time when it is needed because water is a necessity in our community. Great. Great video. I hope that gave you a little bit of a flavor of what we've been doing, what we've been up to the last few years. Uh, Fundifix is just one of the organizations that we were supporting and one of the models uh, you will hear later on uh, in the session about WAVE, uh, another social enterprise in Uganda. And so almost there in terms of discussing the actual meat and the details of, of the work and hearing more about what everyone's doing. And so professionalized maintenance does not mean one particular institutional models, uh, it doesn't mean it's public or private. We're quite agnostic about that. Um, it's, it's basically professional, professionalized maintenance provision across different contexts, um, whether it's an NGO or private sector. Um, and then secondly, I wanted to, to say that there's been quite a lot of different learnings across the work we've been doing globally. Um, in Ethiopia, for instance, in the Afar and uh, SNNPR regions, and in Kabarola district in Uganda that was supported by IRC. Uh, and then also the social enterprise models uh, by WAVE and Fundifix that was just featured in the video. And also some lessons working closely with governments as part of it, uh, as part of this work, testing different approaches. And also more importantly, I would say, feeding into the policy debates, right? Uh, we can't stay at a pilot level because uh, if you want a professionalized maintenance, service, you've got to have a business model that works, and that means also being able to scale that up. And so feeding into those policy debates is really important, including, uh, so I, I do want to just highlight that in Uganda, we were able to feed into the ONM policy debates, uh, particularly through IRC, IRC and WAVE, and also in the country water policy, county, not country, excuse me, county water policy in Kenya. So it's been exciting to really see that evolve and see that work evolve over time. Next, please. And so now for the better part of the session, uh, we will go into breakout groups topics uh, organized uh, across these three themes. 
First is institutional arrangements for maintenance. Really, what are the different kinds of institutional arrangements? As I said before, we're agnostic. We're not saying it has to be private, it has to be public. How do you establish them? At what level, what kinds of entities are involved? Secondly, maintenance is a political priority. I, mentioned, I alluded to that a little bit uh, in the slide before about feeding into policy debates. Actually, when I was at the World Bank and also now in my current job at USAID, I've actually looked and reviewed a lot of policy documents across the world, and maintenance is hardly mentioned in, in many of them. And so it's really important to get that as a political priority. It's always good to construct and rehabilitate and have that infrastructure and rib ribbon cutting. Maintaining the infrastructure becomes a lot more difficult. So that discussion is very important. And lastly, what about the money? Financing maintenance, it costs. So how do we fund that? Who funds that? Um, so lots of lots of great discussions to be had. Uh, I'll turn it over to you, Brittany. Thank you. Thanks, Ella. Okay, uh, so let me quickly introduce our SWS partners who will be presenting in breakout rooms and we'll, I'll then provide some instructions for how this segment will work. We have two presenters in breakout room, one on institutional arrangements for maintenance, Johanna Kohler is an assistant professor of, of environmental policy and governance at Vreed University and supports SWS research and learning in Kenya. Frederick Bergeron is the general manager for Wave Solutions in Uganda. In breakout room two on raising maintenance as a political priority, you'll hear from Lamesa Makanta, who is the country director for IRC Ethiopia. And finally, in breakout room three on financing maintenance, we have two presenters as well. Rob Hope is a professor of water policy at the University of Oxford and leads our work in Kenya. And Adam Harvey is the founder and CEO of Wave Solutions in Uganda. So we'll have approximately 30 minutes for breakout rooms and in a moment we'll, be, we'll all be moving to Zoom. We do recommend you stay logged into BlueJeans just so you can easily return to the session, um, but we'll also be sharing the link in case you get disconnected. There are two ways you can access the Zoom links and I'll, I'll share these on the next slide. So first you can access uh, the Zoom links through our Google site. Uh, we'll drop that link in the chat uh, one more time. The first thing you'll wanna do is navigate to the, professional, the professionalized maintenance page on the left sidebar. Then select which room you want to join and click on the corresponding link. So these are the blue buttons you see on this uh, screen shot. You can also look up your local number if you'd prefer to call in, that's listed, those links are below. And we've included a link to return to the to plenary and some information on how to contact Katie Horan, who is providing tech support uh, for this session. If you have any trouble navigating to our Google site or this maybe just feels too cumbersome, uh, we'll also share the links to each room here in the chat. Uh, and you can always reach out to uh, Katie via the moderator chat again, if you have any, any trouble. So please go ahead and make your choice and join our presenters in Zoom. We'll see you back here promptly at 9.55 uh, Eastern time. Um, and I hope that you all enjoy uh, the discussion.
Thank you everyone for joining us back. Um, we'll just take a minute here to make sure that um, every, uh, everyone has come back to the room, particularly our next guest speaker, Harold. Yeah, I'm, I'm here, Katie. Hey. Uh, if we managed to have 20 odd people in the political priority group, we had a good discussion. And I guess we're waiting now for people to, to move back into the main plenary. Excellent. And we'd love to hear from you in the chat box, everyone. One insight you you had about professionalized maintenance from the breakout rooms. We will be hearing from reporters from each of the room in just a moment um, before we transition into the next segment of today's session. Yes, Rebecca, we will um, have some additional time for Q&A a little bit later after a panel discussion. Um, so, uh, and then we have captured everyone's questions um, and we'll be answering them um, through the weekly digest as well. Okay, thank you everybody. I uh, hope you've made the transition back from your breakout groups to this main Blue Jeans platform. Um, we will um, we'll hopefully have people join us um, who have made that transition back. In the meantime, let's hear from uh, each breakout group and we're, we're asking uh, for a very brief highlight from each one of the rooms. Um, so we'd first of all like to hear from Caleb Cord, who is a, a, a graduate a researcher at the um, University of, of uh, Colorado in Boulder. Caleb, what was uh, one or two key highlights from the institutional uh, arrangement sort of breakout room? Anything you can put your finger on, please? Sure. Thanks, Harold. So we we are two. Uh, Interesting presentations, one from Johanna Kohler working with Fundifix and one from Frederick Bergeron um, and his colleague William from Wave Solutions in Uganda, both of which kind of focusing on new or changing policy landscapes in the um, countries where they're working and the way that that has shifted roles and responsibilities and important implications for the sector. Um, an important point that uh, came up during the conversation was uh, regarding an interesting question on the role of donors in coordinating maintenance services at local levels. Um, with an answer or response from Johanna on um, the, you know, coordination is kind of like the biggest point of that for all of the different actors and their roles and responsibilities. Um, giving the example of the WASH forum that's been highlighted in Kitui County in Kenya, um, you know, throughout the, the work of Fundifix. Um, Wave echoed that with, you know, bringing up their public-private private partnership arrangements. Um, Folks talked about the importance of funding the development of these models and enterprises for professionalized maintenance and also on, um, you know, elaborating on the point of balancing between kind of a historic aid approach with NGOs and other uh, perhaps more uncoordinated infrastructure investors in the country towards moving uh, to this more professionalized approach where we are um, coordinating the, the ac actions and the incentives um, as well as financing from multiple different actor groups um, to strengthen these systems to deliver services. 
Okay, great. Thanks, Caleb. That gives us a real sort of flavor for these, the discussions that you had there. And I think we're going to pick up on some of those issues around donor coordination and on these platforms uh, for exchange of, uh, of information and also dialogue. Um, can we switch to the group, Anna, uh, Anna Libby, who's also a, a graduate researcher with uh, UCB, uh, on the discussion around how do you get maintenance up the political agenda? Um, what, what was discussed in, in the group there, please, Anna? Yeah, um, Lamessa gave a great overview of Ethiopian policy for world water supply over the past 10 years and really how far it's come and how much still left is left to do. Um, and specifically the model that IRC uses to like influence the government and influence polit political priorities towards maintenance um, is really starting with like this horizontal model at the districts um, where getting people together who are stakeholders and sharing their experiences um, really empowers them to then take their, their complaints maybe, their, their priorities up to the national level and get these policies passed, um, as well as helping to translate national policy into something that makes sense locally um, in these very different um, contexts. Um, and then that also, of course, requires political priority from those who are best engaged in the system. And in, in Ethiopia, they found that consumer demand was a really strong driver of that political prioritization. Um, whereas Jean um, Lumba from Uganda mentioned that actually in Uganda, it really came more from the technocratic side. The engineers who were actually working in the district already um, were the ones who were having the loudest complaints about government not prioritizing OM sufficiently. Um, so listen to your engineers, but also listen to your users um, is definitely the message um, people hope that politicians take away from this. Great, thank you, Anna. Um, and I think some interesting parallels in terms of the experiences with Ethiopia and Uganda in terms of the of the transition towards uh, having a fully fledged uh, operation and maintenance infrastructure division uh, in the ministry in Uganda. This recent strategy, so that's that's a, a good uh, lesson to learn. Finally, Pranav on on the financing uh, discussion. Uh, I'm sure there was lots of uh, lots of things to talk about. Can you can you fill us in? Um, on what was said there, please. Yeah, so very interesting discussions uh, that were prompted prompted by uh, some great presentations by Rob Hope and Adam Harvey discussing the financial side of, uh, of Fundifix and Wave, respectively. Um, so one one of the highlights that came out was a discussion around the subsidy required to deliver these services and the extent to which uh, non traditional donors are private sector could could uh, contribute to those through investments and what the incentives are for those investments, recognizing that the incentives may not always be financial, but uh, economic or social, and, and that that would still be contributing to, to uh, the delivery of these services. Great. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much to Caleb, Anna, and Pranav. Could we have the next slide, please? Great. So we've been, um, you've had a chance, hopefully, to go into the breakout rooms and come back. Uh, that all worked, technologically speaking. Um, and thanks again to uh, Anna, Caleb, and Prana for sharing some of the highlights. And these breakout groups are really designed to help uh, give people a chance. Uh, please go back a slide. Uh, give people a chance to um, to unpack some of the specific elements around professionalised maintenance, some of the specific factors. Um, and in this part of the session, the second part, we'd like to sort of aggregate that up, look, start to look across some of these examples and really uh, address this question around, you know, what are the implications of this? So if we want to help strengthen systems that can support better maintenance outcomes, how do we do that? You know, what is the strategy for, for getting there? Uh, and this is an area that we've looked at in SWS as well as the individual country or the teams working at country level, if you like. Uh, the ones that you've just heard from in the breakout groups, there's been a, a group of us looking at, at this question, what are the most common elements of a system that would appear to support or enable better maintenance outcomes and support the kind of professionalized maintenance uh, provision that we've just been discussing about? And to do that, we looked at the learning outputs from across the SWS partners, and we looked at around 100 different examples of, of learning outputs, the reports, uh, raw data, examples of systems mapping, uh, and then tried to pull out these factors to try and 
look and, and, and determine what it is that should be in place and how do we get that. Um, and this work forms part of a, a report which will be forthcoming uh, in the next few weeks, we hope, and I think Brittany will touch upon that when, when she closes around what the resources there are. So next slide, please. So this graphic is a, is a rather simplified version of uh, a pathway or a roadmap that we've identified on the basis of looking across these different experiences. There's a more detailed version of this in, in the report that will come out. And essentially what it tries to do is to look moving from left to right across the diagram. You know, in all contexts, there will be some form of maintenance um, provision in place, however flawed, however incomplete. Um, uh, it may be part of a government-led system uh, to try and um, uh, respond to maintenance challenges. It might be set up by donor projects, by NGOs. It could be set up as a, as a pilot. Um, how do we get from this left-hand side of, the, of this, this schematic to a viable, scaled up, uh, and operating at scale with economies of scale, professionalized um, uh, maintenance regime, if you like, which is accepted and, and um, uh, trusted by users, has the capacity to deliver, and, and is able to monitor its performance? And that's really the question, the key question. Somebody at the very start of these SWS uh, webinars, I think last Monday, raised the question about um, what is the value of these systems tools? You know, they cost a lot of money, they take time. Why should we be applying these learning systems based learning tools? And I think what we found in trying to unpack this question of professionalized maintenance really shows the value of, of using those tools. And I'll explain that in just, just a moment. Essentially, what this diagram says from our learning, from what we've, we've taken from the experiences across these different uh, uh, partner um, attempts to uh, establish more professionalized maintenance, is that you, know, you need to have two sets of elements, two sets of factors in place. The first one um, is at the top of the diagram in the middle, that's the institutional arrangements, you know, who should and could play different roles in terms of providing maintenance, uh, the contracting that needs to be in place, so um, contracts between community users between, and providers, and preferably with, a, with some sort of regulation involved, some sort of oversight, preferably from ideally from a from an independent regulator, but in many cases it comes from a, a local government, uh, is usually the case. And then, of course, the whole question of uh, financing: what are the costs involved? Um, how do you structure tariffs? And, and the transparency around that, and then subsidy delivery mechanisms. But I'm sure you discussed this quite a lot in the, in the financing group. And we said from the outset that these are really known knowns. We could have predicted, in fact, we did predict in initial discussions of, of SWS about five years ago, that we would probably find that these are the, you know, some of the most important factors that can enable a professionalized maintenance uh, outcomes to be delivered. Uh, and indeed, it's proven to be the case. I think we've learned a lot more around these. And there's some great work that's been done by all the partners. And I would encourage you to look at the specific outputs that they're producing around these different factors. But the big uh, takeaway for me in terms of how do we understand professionalized maintenance and how do we get there in terms of this pathway is really the green box at the bottom. And that's where these system-based tools have come in to play. And what's clear and what was repeatedly uh, illustrated across these examples is that as well as the hard factors, um, we need these, these accountability platforms and mechanisms to be in place so that uh, we can um, support and communicate the ideas around professionalized maintenance, particularly to build trust with users, with consumers uh, and other stakeholders. It was really repeatedly picked up that this is a key element of managing perspectives, managing expectations, particularly around payments for services when we start to talk about who pays for what and, and the perception that a private provider is involved, uh, even where they may not be a private provider in the true sense of the word. There's not a, a profit a motive there necessarily. It's really critical to have these accountability spaces that people can discuss, share information, and build this trust. Otherwise, these maintenance uh, 
approaches will never be uh, successfully embedded and scaled up and, and able to grow. And another key element linked to this, and again, we, we've known this for probably many years, but it still came out as very, very important in, in the analysis we, we did of the, what's been learned across these different experiences, is the role of political champions and technocrats. So you can have good policies, you can have um, bylaws in place, but unless they're really applied and adhered to, um, they won't work. So you need these, uh, these political champions, technocratic champions to keep pushing and keep supporting uh, these, these uh, efforts to enforce or to put in place uh, professionalized maintenance regimes. So for example, concessionary areas or service areas, uh, it's, it's one thing to describe them, but to actually make sure that different players uh, adhere to them. You don't have these different actors popping up, particularly around tariffs, sort of applying different tariff uh, regimes across a single service area. It's very disruptive to try and then build a professionalized maintenance outcome. So extremely important uh, at the local level, but also uh, at a higher level. We heard from the experiences of uh, IRC in Ethiopia and in Uganda, IRC's work there in, in working with higher levels of government to try and uh, embed some of these approaches in policy. Lastly, you see the box around or the, the oval at the bottom right there and monitoring data and evidence. I think, again, this is not a new lesson, but I think just reinforces the importance of it that with cr more credible evidence, uh, more data and better data, we can feed that back into political champions, technocrats who can then inject that into uh, these platforms. So very important and, and the best way of getting more data, more credible data, is to have well-functioning maintenance providers that are producing that data. So it's a virtuous cycle. So that's a very rapid run through of, of this pathway. As I say, this will be coming out uh, more in, 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 a, in a report that's due out in a few weeks. Just wanted to sort of tee that up. And before we go into a discussion with the panel uh, to discuss the implications of this, we'd like to hear from uh, somebody uh, from the actual stakeholder group we're talking about, very important players, local government, uh, over and over again, have seen to be the, some of the most critical actors in the local system. So we'd like to hear from the, um, the chief uh, development officer from Karenga district in Uganda, just uh, in her words, what this sort of approach means in terms of the challenges she's facing in her district. So if you could play the video, please. The great Balo is my name. I'm for Chief Administrative Officer Karenga. The great Balo is my name. I'm for Chief Administrative Officer Karenga. In my work for Karenga, the great Balo is my name. I'm for Chief Administrative Officer Karenga. In my work for Karenga District, I welcome the new government policies on maintenance. Rural a great Balo is my name. I'm for Chief Administrative Officer Karenga. In my work for Karenga District, I welcome the new government policies on maintenance. Rural water source functionality has been our worst problem for many years. But now we have a professional management system which is working well. Our communities now have functional pumps every day and willing to pay for maintenance. Our district has signed a contract for a professional maintenance source free wave solution. Our local hand farms mechanics are happy to have their, their work better organized and now they can earn their money from keeping the hand farms functional and communities are happy with their work. We welcome professional maintenance this means that we show the best company that keeps all rural water source working very well. We are developing the key performance indicators and comparing performance. If the company fails, we will appoint a better area service provider, which can provide the service to the people well. We welcome the new national, we welcome the new national maintenance policy for the rural water. Our government staff mobilize communities to understand and sign, and sign service agreements and we see so many communities now paying for this service. This is because they see their benefits. 
it is less expensive as a benefit and then they can buy they can't they don't longer buy water from the service vendors or those ones who charge communities because of water and it saves their time as a benefit saves their time as a benefit from fishing and now in addition to that you'll find that the diseases are reduced due to this water sources available by the wave people to the community we are happy to work with the wave solution right from 2016 up to the date and we have a strong working relationship because web solution is able to deliver at, is able to deliver on a key performance on functionality repair time repair on time and performance contract to the people okay thank you uh that was good to hear um so really uh, the re the reality of all of this uh, on the ground and thank you to wave for providing that uh, that video um i hope that we're technically back in the room um and i would ask uh elizabeth or somebody to go forward the next slide please there we go good okay so we're now at the point where we have a, a interesting and esteemed panel um that we want to pose some of these questions to so we've seen you've looked into these uh, some of these factors in more detail in the breakout room we've tried to show in terms of our understanding how these system uh, strengthening uh, requirements look in, in uh, and the, the the key question is what can we do about it collectively how can we start to address this and to answer that question um, we've invited uh, five panelists I'd ask them to please put on their videos um, so that we can see you all we hope and assume you're all here um, and we're deliberately focusing this panel uh, at a sort of a global level for thinking about um, global development partners. So there will be SWS uh, closeout events in country uh, sharing with national partners. But this, for this purpose of this webinar, we're talking around a global level. Right, Ella, we've got your video. Thank you. Um, Vinny, Heather, David, if you could please put on your, your videos and Christopher as well, please, if you can. Um, so in in this great okay we have now everybody here in this panel and we, we we're also deliberately targeting USAID who are the ones after all who have paid for you know financed this whole uh, effort and um, are the primary client in that sense uh, but we also know an important global player in in, in water and, and development um, and so we've got uh, from the USAID side Ella Lazate who's already been introduced she is the uh, Senior Water and Sanitation Advisor, particular expertise in finance. So uh, thank you, Ella, for all your input so far. Uh, we have Heather Skilling from DAI, who's the Principal Global Practice Specialist uh, for Water and WASH. And Heather has the added um, added advantage of having worked for the previous life at USAID, so she knows from both sides, let's say. Um, so DAI is a con big consulting firm that uh, implements these projects on behalf of USAID. And we have David Tetze, who's with the Catholic Relief Services. Uh, so a, a global NGO working in WASH, also a key partner for USAID. In addition to that, we have uh, Christopher Welsing, Welson from the World Bank, uh, who spent a lot of his time in East Africa um, working on sustainability of rural water supplies. So the bank obviously has a a different uh, perspective and is used to working um, with governments in a certain way also engaging with bilateral donors and last but by no means least we have Vincent Casey so Vinny is the uh, senior wash manager in, at WaterAid in the UK based there uh, and has a wealth of experience in, in looking and thinking about system strengthening so what I'd like to do is start with the USAID stream if that's okay and then bring in Vinny and, and Christopher to sort of complement that from a broader perspective so maybe Ella um, starting with you um, you've seen all this you've, you've been reading about it you've you've listened to this uh, idea about the sister you know supporting systems for professionalized maintenance what can USAID really do about this I mean given your operating environment giving your funding uh, procurement rules, how can you uh, adjust, pivot, do things differently to support the systems that then can better support maintenance outcomes, if I can put it like that? Uh, any initial thoughts from the USAID side? 
Great, thanks so much, Harold. Definitely feel uh, that I'm the target. So, but I do want to listen to everyone else uh, because it's, I wanna be humble about this. Uh, even though we funded this initiative, the idea is really to have a systems approach. And I see this panel really as a way for us to have that discussion uh, to see what we can learn and, and what else people would recommend in terms of USA taking it forward. So I will provide some answers <laughs> and some initial thoughts. Actually, a lot of our thinking on rural water services uh, can be found in our rural water services technical brief that we published last year. And I'll provide a link on, on the chat box very soon. And it was designed to help guide our programming globally and shape our implementing partners and the way they respond to our solicitations, our scope of work. And really, it, it was based off uh, World Bank sustained the World Bank Sustainability Assessment of Rural Water Service Delivery uh, from 2017 and some other publications, as well as our past and current programs, which obviously includes SWS. And so I, I do want to say that it's already a lot of the lessons and the work we've been doing and the discussions we've been having, Harold, um, with you and the other partners um, have already, I would say, infiltrated. <laughs> in our DNA uh, in terms of having this out there as a global brief for USAID. And really important for us to, uh, to show that and, and to have that piece that people can look to. And, and the main takeaways, for instance, was uh, really taking into account um, that self-supply and community-based management uh, generally fail to deliver sustained services without professionalized maintenance support. Uh, second is really thinking beyond the community level, uh, looking at service authorities and national government uh, and the role they play uh, in sustained service delivery uh, in rural services. And then third, designing interventions to build the capacity of community organizations, government and other service providers. And, and a lot of that you mentioned, Harold, in that pathway or in, in, uh, in the graphic that you shared just a few minutes ago. And so those are the types of activities that USAID is definitely uh, able to support and will continue to support. Uh, as uh, many of you know, our strategy also focuses on governance and finance uh, and really taking a systems approach. And, and we make sure that we do that when we work with our uh, different uh, countries that we support uh, globally. And so, I, so I do just want to say that it is part of the work, part and parcel of what we do already. Um, and we hope that we'll be able to scale that up more globally. Uh, I work here in DC. I cannot control what every US aid mission does uh, and how they fund their investments. Uh, but we do provide advice and these kinds of lessons from SWS, for instance, will make sure that those are embedded in, in how we program in the different countries. Um, okay, and, so and I'll stop there for now, unless you have some no, questions. Well, that's a, a very clear kind of uh, opening, you know, position. I think music to many people's ears in, in terms of yeah, looking at strengthening or putting uh, efforts behind those areas that we know need to be developed. And I'm not sure in terms of paying for this. You know, will you be able to put because it's all cost money, you know, uh, to 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 develop these kind of platforms, to get the coordination mechanism in place, it, it costs time and therefore money. And I guess the question is, is can you cover those sort of costs? And I'm talking now very specifically in, gran, you know, in granular terms about programming. Uh, is that something that you'd be able to cover? And once you've answered that, I'd like David and Heather to come in from the kind of the doing side of it. Um, uh, how, what's your take on that uh, quickly, um, Ella? Yeah, I, mean, I think in terms of Adam in our session on financing maintenance really broke down the different costs. So USAID will continue to support these market-based approaches uh, that are promoted and being tested and scaled up by WAVE and Fundifix and others. You will probably see those in the current programs that we have. I think the question perhaps that you're trying to get at, Harold, is will we be subsidizing this for a longer period of time? Because if you look at the cost, the cost of maintenance of a hand pump it's more than what currently users are willing to pay and can pay, and more than what governments can pay, as Rob had uh, presented earlier in our breakout. Uh, there's been some slow uptake from the government side in Kenya, for instance, in, in getting more involved in, in, in really putting more funds into this. And so it's an active, lively discussion within my team in terms of uh, how far we would go in supporting. 
uh, we know that it is important uh, to focus on maintenance because billions of dollars have been wasted. I, I don't want to say wasted completely, but have been spent because we haven't been focusing on maintenance. And so uh, I, I don't want to, to say out here a full <laughs> recorded in a session that we will keep subsidizing O&M costs of rural water maintenance, but we will make sure that we strengthen the systems. And if that takes the form of a little bit of subsidy along with government, and I, I really want to emphasize here, donors and development partners can't fully subsidize everything without the government and user fees. So we have to look at all sources of financing here uh, to really get the job done. Okay, we're not going to get you to uh, promise to <laughs> cover any costs on, on live on air, Ella, so don't worry about that. So David first, and then Heather, how does this discussion uh, reach your ears, let's say? What, what's your perspective as a, a major implementing partner of, of USAID? Uh, do you see a change in their behavior? I mean, how does it look, David? Maybe some initial reaction. Yeah, thanks, Harold, and, and thanks listening to Ella. I, I, I support Ella's point in terms of not taking on the cost of, 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 of maintenance. But I, I'll step up a bit and say back and say, uh, for me, every government or every committee needs to have a, a maintenance plan as part of uh, their strategy, whether it's at the district level or national level. That's one thing that we need to start or look at and making sure that that is done. Uh, with USID currently, I mean, they are focused on looking at, um, you know, catalytic interventions or strengthening government systems that will improve how they budget for uh, watch services and also uh, collecting taxes. Uh, but we just have to be careful here that uh, I don't think one size fits all. There are some people clearly in society that will have to be supported because they, don't, they can't afford based on their, their situation. So that will have to be treated separately. And there are others who can uh, pay for the services and also the maintenance. That's one thing. My last point, it's, it's just the whole issue of professional maintenance. I think we should look at it in three levels, more or less, because there are different types of maintenance has to, that has to tie in the community level and how that links to a, a, a bigger maintenance uh, scheme. We want to move across the service ladder. So that will be uh, my point on this. Mm. And about pushing USA to perhaps be more, because uh, as I as I understand it, you respond to requests for proposals, and this is now getting again to the mechanics of this. Um, do you feel you're able to push back or to suggest things that, that you may not see in there? That, that, that you know, how does that work in terms of your relationship with yeah. the USA, the funder? Yeah, I think it's great, and and, and I like the way they, they sort of uh, request us to show that our interventions are actually going to take service to scale. I mean, that's one of the things that you have to demonstrate that in your submissions. Sometimes, which means we have to look and do things differently, uh, see how we'll be able to uh, sort of either pilot or scale up certain financing mechanisms, depending upon the countries that we work, and also even see what is possible to collect in a country. So that is, for me, a key point that, I mean, we're still sort of going to that phase of seeing what works and what doesn't, but it is, something that you know brings us back to the table for us to think and see which option will work or has worked somewhere else that we can sort of pilot in another country mm. and if that also takes uh, things to scale then uh, we see how that will work with regards to maintenance yeah. okay thank you david heather can i ask you to sort of weigh in here from i guess the perspective of a of a, uh, a, get, a development engineering firm that you work with. How does this look in terms of the way you are asked to work with USAID? Are there, is there any room for maneuver in terms of the design of these programs where you can include more on systems type approaches? Or do you already see that coming from, from USAID? What, do, what is your perspective on that? I think I, I wanted to pick up on Ella's point about sort of that movement of information within USAID because I, I do think that's important and I think I think this investment in building knowledge within USAID has been really important but Ella made that point that you know there's still that cascade of information out to missions and then into RFPs that people can respond to and that's not an easy process I mean we all know about some of the hurdles about moving information through the sector 
and aid is its own animal with its own ability to move information. So I think I think we are starting to see the systems perspective being integrated in, into RFPs, but I do think that sometimes the language stays a little bit obscure. So I, I think that we are still relying too much on the term sustainability when we're actually talking about professionalized maintenance, for instance. And I, I think that bringing some of that granularity into the conversation would actually be helpful, but also taking David's point that you want to allow that flexibility, right, for good solutions that are appropriate locally. So I think that's still a balance that we haven't quite achieved. Um, I think some of the new procurement modalities coming out of aid help to try and find that right balance. But I, I do think that um, we need to start thinking more carefully about what we mean about sustainability and rooting in more specific language. And I, I do think that would be helpful. I also think that there are some, some really detailed nuances in some of this conversation, like just transportation. <laughs> like, you know, how many times have we found that the, the issue around monitoring, the issue around maintenance just comes back to the ability of technicians to get around some of these really challenging terrains. And I think that, you know, we're obviously, we haven't solved some of these core systemic issues yet, but I think now there's a whole nother circle of conversation around the system and what's in, what needs to be con included in our consideration of the system that's going to start being important and interesting. Hmm. Okay, great. So if I hear you right, in very important sustainability and systems where we have to land it, we have to make it more specific for uh, actually rolling it out on the ground. And this, this speaks to uh, a question for Ella from, um, from somebody in the chat. I'm trying to look through do and walk at the same time is a bit difficult. Rebecca Giannati, which we'd like to hold that question, but Ella, maybe you could have a look at that in the chat box. It's, it's exact, well, it speaks to what uh, Heather was talking about in terms of cascading down. And while you're considering that, I'd like to broaden the discussion and bring in Chris and, and Vinny, because we know that, you know, USA doesn't operate in a vacuum. There's lots of other development partners out there working on very similar or same issues we saw this pathway, which involves a lot of different elements to it, and, and no one organization can do everything. Um, uh, and so how does this look, Chris, maybe to start with you, um, working with a bilateral like USAID, when you're in discussions with government designing these kind of big investment programs, how can you work with somebody like USAID if there's a mission that's interested in this? What are the synergies you can come up with in terms of trying to look at, understand, and address these, these systemic challenges? around rural water. Thank you, Harold. Can you can you hear me? I just want to check if I'm yes, audible. Yes, we hear you, we hear okay. you and see you well. But th yes. Thank you so much. This is very interesting. And, and also, like I participated in the breakout session with the Uganda team, very interesting what they're doing there. So, so I think for me, so I've lived in Kenya for about four years, Tanzania for five years, worked a lot in Tanzania. And what I like to do um, with, with the sustainability issue, tariff issue, is to look at the issues in an aggregate way. So for instance, in Tanzania, which is in many ways similar to Kenya, we have more than 14,000 villages. 14,000 villages. So, so the, the, the scale of the problem needs to be appreciated. So, so I like to start there. And then if you divide you know, the number of districts by a number of villages or, or rural water schemes, you get about 75 um, schemes per you know, district office. And then from there, you can easily see that, okay, you know, a performance-based maintenance model makes a lot of sense because there's no way that this district engineer and his team can handle the, the vastness of, of, of these investments. So, so that's one, which is humbling to think of just the aggregate number. Then if we look at the financing gap in the sector, just for new investments. So in, in, in Tanzania, we are having conversations with Ministry of uh, Water or the new water agency right now, and we are trying to, we designed a $350 million rural water and sanitation project with focus on sustainability. And we've been implementing that and more money is needed. So now they're saying we need 
600 million dollars at least and i would say to solve the issue of rural water supply in in in, in this country so i think it's probably closer to two, two billion dollars they need in like investment in new schemes of rehabilitation so that is such a humbling number because there's no way that the world bank can finance, or even the donors in the sector can finance $600 million. The, the government is always putting, already putting in so much funding to the sector. Okay, so let's stop there. How, what is that, how is that, how does that relate to some sustainability? Well, if you want a subsidy for sustaining existing systems in an area where you have this vastness of systems and you have this huge financing gap, to me, the subsidy model is not scalable. Like it's, it's not, it, 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 we, we won't be able to scale that model. We can't expect the government to go in and subsidize systems where they have this huge financing gap on the, on the infrastructure side. So, so I think that, that in itself is very humbling. Um, so I think we have to look at the tariff. We have to look at, did, did the tariff we have right now, did it follow inflation? Is there a willingness to pay? Is there an issue with willingness to charge? Of course, within each village, there'll be very poor people and there will be people who are willing to pay more. And if you look at villages that are not, do not have access, that there they're paying off much higher uh, rates for water. So we think that within the village, there are often a mechanism where, you know, okay, 10% of the population do not pay, but then the rest pays. So, so really to look at the tariff is critical. One of the things that I am promoting in Tanzania through a small pilot is introduction of prepaid meters where you pay with mobile money. And with that, we have seen a revenue increase between 50 to 400% on a pilot basis. So as soon as you introduce a ring fence secure payment system, the revenue goes up. Then we are trying to cluster villages right now between 30 and 50 villages per contract with the private sector. But in my mind, we have to go up to like 200, 500 villages in one cluster and really bring in a private sector where you can have a strong performance bond where their willingness to, to move in to the private, uh, to have a private sector provider who can be there for five, 10 years. Actually, when we look at the energy sector, they have you know 15 year contracts. So, so try to have new technologies with remote sensing and pumps to, to, to make it easier for the private sector to establish are these pump working or not, remotely monitoring from prepaid meters, are people paying for water. So that's, that's where, at least where my focus is going forward, where I see the, folk, uh, the, the sector moving forward. I talked a lot, I'm sorry, let, let, me, let me hand over, let me stop here. Thanks, Chris, for sharing those uh, those uh, thoughts and reflections, mainly around financing. I think yeah, what you're illustrating there is it's a huge challenge. I think we know that, but it's not enough to say, well, we throw up our hands. It's not, it's not solvable. We've seen the efforts of, of uh, examples like Wave and Fundifix trying to address that subsidy gap in different ways. Um, but what's clear is from what you're saying, you need pilots to be embedded. You need that learning. You need to then be able to take it to scale which is all part of this sort of trying to push for a systems uh, understanding. Um, very difficult to do. Vinny, you're, you've had lots of years of experience with this, with water aid in many different countries around the world. You're doing a major program on, on looking at it through a systems lens. What are your, you know, listening to Chris about that sort of challenge, what's your views on how we can work collectively, um, partners of USAID with government, obviously, and with the likes of the bank. I mean, what, what is your view on this from the water aid perspective? Thanks, Harold, um, and thanks everyone, and thanks for having me today. Um, I think um, some great points have been made, and there are, I can see many synergies um, between um, what's being suggested as ways of strengthening uh, the system for um, professionalized maintenance and what, what water aid can do um, to complement uh, some of those activities. Um, in relation to some of the points that uh, Chris was making just, just now um, regarding financing, there are definitely a few areas where, where through 
um, our partners and direct contacts within communities and, and at local government level, we can do a lot to increase willingness to pay um, a lot of the software activities needed to do that and the behavior change necessary um, is certainly something that we can do. But we have to face the fact that in some remote rural areas where there isn't a cash economy, but there is a need for professionalized maintenance and there is a need to get the necessary finances in place to support that. Um, there's also a, a need for advocacy um, to direct the necessary finances to those areas to pay for these essential functions. Now, that could be through conditional grants, like you see the conditional grant in Uganda somewhat covers some of that, but not enough um, of the major maintenance in some cases. Um, but it's also through targeting of, of grant funding um, at complete rehabilitation. Um, for example, in, in Ethiopia, uh, where we're working in Aromia, um, we've managed to channel finances to completely overhaul um, small town pipe water supply services to get it to a level whereby um, it's realistic that people can pay for minor maintenance and the tariffs can, can cover that. So thinking about some of these more remote areas where there isn't a cash economy, we have to be realistic that the money isn't there, the ability isn't there to pay um, and looking at other, other mechanisms to do that. A lot of that's about advocacy, um, but also targeting a grant financing, as I said. Um, there are other areas where we can complement um, USAID's efforts. And, and I, I should really say that it's fantastic that USAID are funding system strengthening and this particular SWS initiative and others. I mean, um, we get involved quite a lot in the political economy analysis, not just to identify barriers to sustainability broadly, um, but also including professionalized maintenance um, and identifying government champions that, that can really um, support and work. To, to get the necessary legislative, legislative sorry, uh, enabling environment in place, which, which transcends down to policies and contracts um, that, that enable um, professionalized maintenance. Um, additionally, um, we do quite a lot uh, when it comes to clarifying roles and responsibilities within certain management models. There are many different actors with different roles, and it's often vague who's paying for major maintenance. It's often the area that's parked away uh, that doesn't get attention, who's paying for it and who actually undertakes it. Uh, so we've got um, various tools that we use to try and facilitate that process at the local level and resolve disputes. Um, an example would be in Maputo in Bawani, where we did that quite recently uh, using this who does water tool, which, which attempts to try and get this kind of clarity with government actors in the room, with donors in the room, and very importantly, with members of the community and the municipality leadership in the room uh, where there are disputes over contracting authority for this kind of thing and where the money's coming from. They're so trying to get that clarity. So there, there, there are quite a few synergies on that front. Um, and just, I think as an NGO, um, NGOs come in for a lot of criticism where they're introducing, uh, using a somewhat failed community management model, essentially free services into areas where attempts are being made to, to increase willingness to pay and get um, the necessary revenues in place, at least for minor maintenance. That would be wonderful. Um, and so not introducing services into these areas that, that are essentially given away for free, um, but of course fail after a short period of time. So not undermining efforts uh, to, to professionalize maintenance as well is an important thing for INGOs and, and, and other NGOs working in this sector to remember not to do. Um, but yeah, those are just some of the, the, the synergies uh, there. Um, yeah, there are quite a few others, but that's just some for now. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Vinny. I see there's a very lively chat going on around financing, and I think some of the questions are being answered in real time, and those we can't get to, we will provide uh, answers for, uh, and we will produce, I think there's gonna be a, uh, uh, response a little sort of uh, newsletter going out in a couple of days to, to pick up on those. I wanted to go back and pick up on what you just mentioned, Vinny, and, and thinking about Chris, your role in, in the bank and donor coordination, because that's a big topic that um, you know, we know is, is important. Uh, and it maybe speaks to this question from Rebecca Giannotti, if I say it right, about priorities set in DC and those carried out the mission level. So Ella, I don't know if you've had a chance to reflect on that. and maybe to think about 
how do we do a better job collectively of working together? You know, we know the classic sort of poor coordination where you different programs doing different things in the same area. How can you sort of impress on mission staff in, a, in any way you can, nudge, cajole, um, influence, bribe, I don't know, uh, to work more collectively in that way? Um, do you have any thoughts on that in terms of USA sort of the, thinking about the global versus the national and then down what Heather was talking about, having to land these things uh, on the ground? You're muted, by the way, Ella. Yeah, no, I was I was just going to say that, as Rebecca also mentioned, that that requires a whole new breakout session, right, <laughs> with 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 some sick secrets spilled. So I'll I'll just say a few things about that. I mean, I like I said, it's really a systems approach for us internally. And by that by that, I mean, we have to actually change the system within which I work and my colleagues work within USAID to trickle it down all the way to the USAID investments on the ground. And so I already mentioned in my opening intervention, our global technical brief, it sounds silly, it's a document, but that document is something we can always refer to. A document itself is nothing unless we can actually engage, we've engaged colleagues here to produce that kind of document and some mission colleagues, but engaging at the mission level. Uh, I think there was a, a breakout group on political priority, maintenance as a political priority, similarly in USAID. We got to get this uh, as a priority within the missions, and and that's politics, right? I, I, how do we? How do we? It's, I think Vinny mentioned advocacy. Part of my job, a lot of my job, is advocacy, and that's not part of it. Is getting on webinars, getting on a platform, inviting mission colleagues to to engage. But really, it's that one-on-one -on -one discussions with the different missions that we're targeting that are thinking about these kinds of investments and working with them on thinking through how to do it smartly. And Heather, I think the first step was sustainability. You mentioned, how do we get beyond it? I think we're now in a trajectory that we can get beyond the sustainable water services and we can actually talk more specifics. And SWS has really been a great initiative to get us there, to get uh, um, some of the data that we were missing before. And uptime obviously has crunched some numbers as well. Um, and so a lot of it is those kinds of engagement. Uh, we're also building the capacity of our staff and making sure that we have mission staff to actually be able to engage with Chris, for instance, in the different countries and engage at that level with the government and with the ministries. And we haven't really been staffed up enough, uh, as Heather would know from when she was from her time at USAID. And we've been really ramping that up. Um, in some of our missions, and we hope to continue to do this so and really strengthen the capacity of our staff to do it because I can't do it here from DC. And so, I mean, those are just some of the ways. Um, it's a lot of advocacy, as Vinny said, and I have to do that internally. Okay. Well, okay. Thank you, Ella, for that very, uh, that very open and honest answer, I think. And um, yeah, I think it's a question of all of us working better and changing and trying to address this. So maybe that's a good way to close because I think we're running towards the end of this panel and then we're have a quick wrap up from from Brittany, but maybe I could ask each one of you to you know reflect on one thing or a couple of things that you could do differently to move in this direction to you know take a more systems based approach, think about working collectively with uh, with partners, maybe influencing the uh, your donors who you work with, working with government. So David, what would you from CRS perspective, how would you what would you do differently um, if you had uh, uh, if you if you had the chance to do that? From our CRS point, we would sort of uh, highlight the technical services, making sure that if we, whatever package we, we, we adopt in country or at regional level, it is not only includes the financial services arrangements that are necessary, but also taking steps to ensure that we, 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 we provide services and training of, that will help people gain the necessary skills to be able to do maintenance at all levels at a community level or a district level. Uh, uh, yeah. That's one thing that will not only focus on the community maintenance schemes, but making sure there are different levels of maintenance depending upon the scheme. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, again, a capacity question both internally for USA with Ellen and, and you now talking about the different levels of, uh, of maintenance provision. Chris, what would you, what could you do differently? We've heard a lot about your thoughts on the financing side. Are there other things that you would you would do to try and uh, work in a 
or collective way influence government? Yeah, I, I mean, I my, my current work is mostly in Tanzania, where we have you know uh, local staff there, uh, international staff based there, and it's the same, of course, in Nairobi. We had a lot of staff who are always willing to collaborate, and we also have uh, frequent donor partner meetings where all this is coordinated. So I think there are, um, you know, we have set up systems for us to collaborate. So, so I think that those are all there. I was just saying in general. I mean, I really like this, this, these approaches, all these examples coming out. It's very impressive how we're pushing this sustainability agenda and trying to professionalize. I think that the sector is moving in a very good direction. But to me, you know, we don't have a lot of grant financing. Our loans go to the government and then we help them implement. But to me, the, the, this, the level of success of what we should aim for, the measure of success is when the government recognizes something and tries to adopt what you're already doing. So I can see in Kitui, I mean, that's really interesting, but that should be the objective to demonstrate something to the to government so they can adopt and scale. So whenever we are doing that, I think that we are on the right track. Let me stop here. No, no, that's a, that's a great point. I think uh, seeing is believing, and when you've got something that can show promise, it's a great way of uh, opening doors. Heather. What would, from a DAI perspective, can you do anything differently, or are you just bound shackled to USA proposals <laughs> uh, you have to respond to? Can you stick things in there that are a bit more interesting? What's what, what, what's a couple of things you would do differently? I mean, you you are a bit shackled, you know, to be frank. But but I do think this question about evidence and messaging is is really key, and I do think there is an opportunity for implementers to self-invest um, a bit more around developing the kinds of evidence that's interesting and important, not just for building that government commitment that Chris was just talking about, but also to be able to share with donors to help advance their internal agendas and, and to make the point about how things could and should be structured to sort of accelerate um, the whole conversation and, and the direction that we're heading in. I think That's we haven't true. quite nailed down what the what types of evidence and messages are most resonant with different um, audiences. Just a, a very quick straw poll from our audience. The financing side is clearly one that's very important. We're seeing a lot of questions on that, but. That's a great um, reflection, Heather. So maybe we all do more to kind of capture the lessons that we're we're learning and feeding it back. And doesn't mean, I guess, that you need to be paid to do that, but you could also try and do it um, from your own volition. Vinny, what about war trade? What can you do? Um, working in so many countries, um, you know, you have a long history of working in in these areas around sustainability. How can we make it more specific and more practicable on the ground? Yeah, I think um, thanks, Harold. I think that what we can do more of is 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 really, I mean, when it comes to practice advocacy and and promoting what works and what doesn't work, um, it's it's got to be rooted in in the context of what's there, obviously, and what the specific challenges are. Often you see that financing is a huge one, um, so having a massive organisational priority to try and address that as part of a new strategy um, is 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 one thing. Um, another thing is um, that when when um, we're working in many um, multiple different areas, there there, there can be a, a big difference in in willingness and ability to pay. Um, so to ensure that we've got enough different options open to us uh, to to try and improve the situation when it comes to professionalised maintenance and financing that. Um, so I think. Those those two things, and then sharing um, Ella's sort of uh, point that she was making about internal advocacy. There's a lot of internal advocacy to be done in water aid to to really get this high up on the strategic agenda. Um, it's there, but it's 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 sometimes fragmented. Um, so consolidating under one big push on on sustainability, not just on on you know some of the issues that we've discussed here, but also the power dynamics that exist with politicians um, getting getting it prioritized and, and, and how you do that and how you navigate those politics and the behind the scenes motivations for and and against prioritizing it um, I think uh, we can we can do much more on. 
Um, so yeah, those those are just some things. Thanks. Thanks very much, Vinny, and thanks to all the panelists for your very open and honest uh, reflections. I think it's you know a testament to the fact that we're talking about this today, that we've got this uh, body of evidence, that it, that we we are you know keeping on moving in the right direction. There's much more work to be done. Um, for the lots of comments in the chat box, we will go through those and try and curate those and get back to people. I know there's been some back and forth. I'd like to thank all the panelists and all, indeed, all the presenters from from Wave, from Fundifix, from IRC Uganda, IRC Ethiopia, and all the inputs. Um, and uh, this discussion will be continued. I'm sure there'll be more to come. And I'd like to hand you back to Brittany who will say a bit more about the next in this uh, never ending, um, the gift that keeps on giving that is SWS closeout. So uh, Brittany, <laughs> over to you. Thanks, Harold. Okay, great. I'll just take us through uh, quickly a few final slides if we can advance to the next. Uh, first, if you would like to read up more on SWS learning around professionalized maintenance, please do visit our Global Waters site. That's www.globalwaters.org slash slash SWS, hopefully pretty easy to remember. Um, and we have on the site, we have uh, resources curated around all of these priority topics. So we have a long list of resources specifically on professionalized maintenance. And I also wanna flag that we have two flagship resources that are forthcoming. Um, we have a flagship report on learning across SWS that will be published in October, as well as the University of Oxford will be publishing a brief on shifting legal and policy processes to promote professional maintenance in Katui County, Kenya. So please stay tuned for those. A few products you can check out now uh, listed here. First is a brief that provides a definition and key characteristics of a professionalized service, uh, which we mentioned at the beginning of today's session. Second is a flagship report from our partner WAVE that presents 10 factors considered key to the viability of sustained and consistent service delivery. And finally, from our partner IRC, we have a paper exploring monitoring and asset management practices in the Afar region of Ethiopia, as well as the use of pay-as-you-fetch in Uganda. So we'll be dropping all those links in the chat. And tomorrow we'll send a tap into SWS learning email with some short videos and a fun game uh, that you can play to learn more about collective action and WASH. And this will offer a nice preview of Wednesday, our final deep dive session where we will share lessons and findings from 11 collaborative approaches in the WASH sector studied under SWS. So we hope to see you there on Wednesday. And finally, I would like to thank Harold Lockwood um, for organizing this session. His email is listed on the slide here, as well as our SWS partners for sharing their insights and experiences in the breakout rooms. We also greatly appreciate our panelists for their time and wisdom. Uh, and finally, thank all of you, our audience, for your continued engagement and great questions uh, throughout this learning series. So that brings us to the end of today's session, right on time. And we do hope to see you uh, this Wednesday and Thursday for our final two sessions. So thanks for your continued support and uh, inquisitiveness and uh, goodbye for now. <laughs>